Now, Second Chronicles chapter 5. Thus, all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated, and the silver, and the gold, and all the instruments, but put he among the treasures of the house of God. I mean, the house is finished, and what do you do? You, you move in. That's what he's doing right now. He's moving everything in like it's supposed to. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, that's the heads of the people, and the heads of the tribes. Uh, there's an ambassador for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. The chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto Jerusalem. So he's calling for all the head of the assembly, all the big people, all the people in charge, unto Jerusalem. Now, when we went through the book of Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God kept on saying, there's a place where I'll put my name. There's a place where I'll put my name. There's a place where I'll put my name. It wasn't in that tabernacle that they carried because that place was from point to point to point to point to point. And then it was pushed push off during the side. It was forsaken during King Saul. But this is the place now. This is where God put his name. It's in Jerusalem. And if you don't believe me, read the newspapers. And this is one time you're going to have me tell you to read the newspapers. Other times, throw them in the garbage can. Because all the world will go here, 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 and we go back to Jerusalem. And we get something that happens in Boston. And we get something that happens in Mississippi. And we go back to Jerusalem. Then Korea starts acting up. And then you get an earthquake in Iran. But we go back to Jerusalem. It always goes back to Jerusalem. Always. Because Jerusalem is the center of the world. This is where God said he'll put his name. And then all things, listen, everybody's fighting for this land. I guess everybody wants God and they want God in their own way. But there's only one people of God. To bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Okay, remember David brought the ark, finally he brought it right. He brought it to the city of David, which is called Zion. Now they're going to bring it into Jerusalem. Now they're going to bring it into the ark. They're finally going to give God the place. They're going to take care of God. They're going to do right. Wherefore, all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto the king in the feast, which was in the seventh month. That's... There are October, September, October. There were many feasts in the seventh month. Gee, I mean, if you were going to pick a month that you were going to bring the ark into the temple, where the ark is going to come in into the most holy place, and it's going to stay there, and it's supposed to stay there for all eternity. I mean, if you were to pick a month that Jesus Christ would be born in, if you look at the ark, you know, it's got the wood inside, and it's covered with the gold. Gee, I wonder what month you choose. I'm sure it's not hope. It's December. I think Jesus was born in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, not ours. By the way, you do know our calendar is Roman Catholic. You know, Roman. You do know that. You do know that each of the months are named after the planets, named after the gods of the planets, which are Roman and Greek. Oh, I didn't say Greek. I'm sorry. God's. Wherefore all the men of Israel set themselves unto the king in a feast which was in the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites took up the ark. Oh, look at that. Solomon does it right. You just picture David somewhere, either talking to Solomon, or he writes something out. Let the Levites carry the ark on their shoulders, my son. Don't you do what I did the first time and put it on the car. You see that grave over there? Uzzah? That guy died because we did it wrong. And they brought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. These did the priests and the Levites bring up. So they're doing it right. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him, both before the ark, sacrificed sheep and oxen. Which could not be told nor numbered for a multitude to do. And it's amazing this temple, this temple that Solomon builds, is finally built. It's finally taken of all the stuff you cannot number. 
Now, this temple is a representation of what glory is going to be like. Yeah, I know it's on the earth. I know it's built by man. The Solomon is a type of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I go prepare a place for you that I might come and receive you back. You just imagine of all the stuff that we've seen, they're unnumbered. And the fact is, when we finally get to glory, you, you still cannot. You know what I think? I still think when we get to glory, I still think you can't count the angels if you sat there for all eternity and line them up. You cannot count days and years. Now, I'm sorry. It's a beautiful song, Amazing Grace. But when we've been there for 10,000 years, sorry, there are no years in eternity. Time stop. You can't count time. There is no calendars in the glory. And when I was at the prison ministry, when I taught those men, I said, you think about hell like this. There's a clock on the wall in hell, and there's no hands, and God says you can get out at 11 o'clock. And you just sit there. I said, you can't go day after day. I said, you can't go minute. I said, there is no time. You're just sitting in hell looking at that clock, and that's it. That's eternity. All the unnumbered things that we're seeing. Heaven is unnumbered. The glory of God. Praise the Lord. I tell you, there's a spot. And when I said, fine, I want to make that as my memory verse. Paul says something about that we can't comprehend. Now, I'm, I'm just quoting that verse completely. But let's get that verse again. I want to memorize that because it's just, you can't even fathom what heaven's going to be like. <coughs> And a second, and the priest brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord unto his place. Now they say his, they call it his. I guess during the, the National Organization for Women, they had changed the Bible to say her place. And now that you got the Sodomites running around, you put whatever it is, place. Let's make our Bibles up to date. We do have a rainbow Bible out there, you know, for the Sodomites. Wickedness. Unto his place, to the oracle of the house. That's the holy, the holy place of all holy places. Into the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread forth their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim covered the ark, and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves of the ark, that the ends of the staves were seen from the ark before the oracle. But they were not seen without. And there, there it is unto this day. In other words, they pulled those staves out. That ark is not to move anymore by man. They pull them out. They put them up against the wall somewhere because it's part of the furniture. And no more is that place going to move. God, if I could say reverend, with, I know there's a lot of people out there, they're going, you know, has found the resting place. But wouldn't it be great we can end Second Chronicles chapter 5 and hear the staves in verse 8. We, we could just end at that period. But we can't. And it's not God's resting place. Because for all have sinned and come to short of the glory of God. All have done wickedness. There is none righteous. There is none that seeketh after God. No, not one, the Bible says. And I don't care if you're Indiana Jones or whoever you think you are. You can't find that ark. It's missing until you go to Revelation and find out it's with God. God carried that ark home. We're going to get in now, which we even read today as our family. When we read that Ahaz goes in there and he took down the oxen that we read about the other night. He took down those lavers that were for the animal washes. And he just threw it on the pavement and made his own little... Uh, altar of sacrifice. He made his own little things. The glory of God that we're reading in these chapters is going to be destroyed by the wickedness of man. Listen, the church ain't getting better. It's getting worse. And Paul told you, and if you don't think it, you think you're going to have this great time and fellowship and all that, you're a fool because read what Paul said. Read the book of Revelation. The church is lying to itself. We're rich. We have increased goods. We're not the, and God says you're, make, you're naked. You're miserable. You're a liar. 
you got the devil in the front seat, amen, the preacher, the preacherettes, and all the other foolishness going on. And you got Jesus Christ outside the door knocking. Can I come in? Or you, as a matter of fact, I don't even want to go in. You come out to me, and we'll sup. Jesus Christ doesn't even want to go into today's church. And he's absent from most churches today. There was nothing in the ark. Say two tables, which Moses put therein in Horeb. That's the Ten Commandments. When the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, what happened to Aaron's rod? What happened to the pot of manna? The manna was put there to show that the children of Israel, what God did provide for their needs when they were in the wilderness for those 40 years. What happened to it? Who, who went in there and, grabbed, and took it out? Who went into the ark and grabbed Aaron's rod? Now, let me, let me point something else before we move on. What else was part of that ark? Where is it? Not there, but that's the whole thing. And when they when, when when they brought that back on the ark and they looked in the Bible says and God struck certain mount dead. Listen, Uzzah touched the ark and he died. You sure we're gonna pick that mercy seat up? God has fried you right there, just like Uzzah. The mercy seat is gone. It's just the box. There is no mercy seat. It's in heaven. The, the manna. Why would that be gone? Because when the children of Israel went into the, into the promised land, did they do what God told them to do? No, they didn't wipe out all the heathen. And God said, I'm going to leave some of those nations there to try you. Had they done what God did, told them to do, 100 complete obedience, God would have gave them the... Listen, look at the grapes they brought. Trying to find grapes today without being scientifically uh, advanced. And you can't find grapes like that. Aaron's rod that brought life. Oh, wait till you see what we're going to see in the future of Second Chronicles. What happens to this temple the Lord carries. Is there going to be anything but flourishing? Let me ask you today. If you were to go over to Jerusalem today and go over to Mount Moriah, what would you see? Would you see the holies of holies? No, you see the, the dome of the rock. By, a, by the two religions of the world that are, are massing themselves in the world, Roman Catholicism and Mohammedanism, Islam. The dumb of the rock is taken by Islam, and the Roman Catholics will show you everything in Jerusalem that's not true according to your Bible. They'll show you where Jesus was crucified. No, the Bible tells you he was crucified outside the gate. Let's get it right. So the Aaron's rod, the mercy seat, and the manna are missing. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified, they better have been, and did not then wait by course. In other words, they put the ark in there and they got out. They knew they were in the presence of God. They knew that there was only to be the high priest. They knew that God was only allowed to be temporary to go in to drop that ark and to get out. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of Jethuthan, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen. Wow, the white linen that, that compassed the courtyard is now the, the singers are wearing. I wonder if they compassed the whole land in this temple. Like the wall of the tabernacle. That's what I picture. Having symbols and psalteries, and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, that would be the brazen altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests, 
sounded with trumpets. That must have been a joyful celebration. That must have been a joyful time for the Lord. No flesh bebopping. No drums. Doing it only for the glory of God and not for self and not for flesh. And it came to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one. Unity. In other words, the notes of the music and the notes of the singers matched. No one was out of place. Now you know God was in that. And you know they practiced. You know they worked on it. You know they rehearsed. You know they put time into it. That you know that they gave it all to the glory of God. And it came to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in the praising and thanking of thanking the Lord. Singing is to be praising and thanking the Lord. You can't be praising and thanking God when the lyrics of the song violates God's word. You can't have it. Because John wrote in John chapter 1, the word is Jesus Christ. And if it doesn't match the word, you are false interpreting who Jesus Christ is. Read the hymnals. The, the songs and the hymnals. Read them. With an open Bible. Silent night. You mean the most busiest night of year and all the people were called to be taxed? All the merchandise, all the stuff going on, all the people going to the booths and all that? The cows mooing, the goats, whatever the goats do, and the and the sheep bat hanging. Read the hymns. Most of them are wrong. They're pretty, but most of them are wrong. We do, we, isn't there a song where the th three kings? Name the three kings. Mo, Larry, and Curly. Doesn't say anything about three kings. Fools, fools, fools. Lift up their voice with trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praising, praise God, the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Alright, songs are to be praising, they're to be thanking, they're to say that God is good. They're to the sing about God's mercy that endureth forever. And that then the house was filled with a cloud. Now this is a, if you want to study in the Bible, you study that cloud because that cloud is going to show up again. That cloud is going to show up as a shadow of death. Psalms 23. That cloud was a pillar by day and a fire by night that led Israel. That's a very special cloud there. Read about clouds. Elijah goes up, or Elisha, which one, goes up to a guy. He says, uh, go. He says, I see a cloud and it has the shape of a man's hand. He says, you better run because here comes rain after a famine. Study the clouds in the Bible. Interesting subject. So that the priest could not stand to minister by the reason of the cloud. Now come on. What kind of cloud is this? That they couldn't stand. You imagine here comes an airplane. It's flying in the sky. It's got a cloud. They're thinking about, they bounce off the cloud. This is no ordinary cloud. This is a cloud of holiness. This is a cloud that as you walk up to it, I'm not worthy. And you back off. This is a cloud. Listen, I am in the presence of God. I got to back off. This is a cloud that tells me, get down on my knees. 
This is a cloud. I better start confessing my sins I'm doing. This is a cloud. I better do right. This is the God of all gods, the gods that were praising cloud. This was no ordinary cloud. This is a cloud that worked on people's heart because it said, so the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the clouds. Stand, it means they hit the ground on their knees. They couldn't do the job that they were supposed to do, that they wanted to do. For the glory of the Lord, that's the cloud, had filled the house of God. Now, wouldn't it be great if we had that today? Wouldn't it be great to, you know, you move into a new area and you settle in, you go into the church, you look for a church, and you know what? You're staying in church, and here comes this cloud, and it just like makes you fall to the ground. Hey, this is my home. But, Brother Stiley, this doesn't happen like this. No, because you got a King James Bible to figure out if your church is right or wrong. That's your cloud. If that church don't follow this Bible, you need to pray and ask God to meet somewhere else or start another church. If that church don't match this Bible, there's no cloud. Unless you change the cloud. Anything but a King James 6011 Bible. This is our cloud today. We have the more sure word of prophecy, Peter says. We have it black and white. And we could take it to any courtroom if we had any respectable judge in this country. Oh, how the church has gone south, how the church has gone wrong. That closes another chapter.